Hey, and welcome to the show. I thought today I would just kind of go on to progressives.org and, you know, uh, kind of read out what they have in regards to, you know, news and all that stuff. And the first one um, is by uh, Fadel Kaboob, uh, who I'm hoping I didn't mispronounce that. If I did, I apologize. Anyway, so he's a uh, he's an Ohio-based uh, MMT economist who uh, has done several. He was on the Rising earlier today, so check that out. Uh, he was also on 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 YouTube. Um, he was he's all, he was also uh, involved in quite a few uh, webinars uh, that are you know, presented by real progressives um, in the past few months, really. Uh, he just did one that uh, was talking about Medicare for All and MMT. Um, anyway, so great person, a great mind for MMT and economics, period. Uh, anyway, so Stockholm plus 50 pre-summit address on global just transition from fossil fuels. Dr. Fadhel Kaboob's remarks, thank you all for being here. It is a pleasure to join you. I know, I, I know we have limited time, so I'm setting up my timer and I'm going to give you a few messages uh, to start the conversation. First message, we cannot decarbonize a system that has not been decarbonized yet. Similarly, we cannot de, uh, dem democratize, democratize a system that has not been decolonialized yet. I am talking about colonial and neo-colonial economic structures that are still alive and well. They are still sucking resources, wealth, and causing so much uh, economic pain. The fossil fuel system is uh, the fossil fuel system is part of it. Uh, extractism is part of it. That is the first message. The second message, if I tell you that I really recognize uh, that uh, climate change is a problem and I tell you uh, I'll do my best to help, in quotes, uh, quote, uh, un uh, quote, unquote, uh, and I promise to give you $100 billion, then many, many years later, I show up and say, well, I only had eight, but I didn't tell you that annually I'm taking $2 trillion from you. This is what we're dealing with. The global financial architecture is sucking wealth from the global south. If we take two groups, the global south and global north, and net out all global financial transactions, including trade, investment, interest payments, debt can uh, cancellation, and aid, the net amount is $2 trillion annually, moving from the poorest countries to the richest countries. So we're not going to put a dent in climate change unless we undo the neocolonial economic structures, the global trade and financial architecture. Phasing out fossil fuels is part of that. On the fossil fuel front, in terms of the cost, we talk about, uh, well, well, uh, it's too expensive to transition out of fossil fuels, but we're not talking about the cost of doing nothing, the cost of inaction, we're already paying for the fossil fuel hidden costs with blood, tears, and money. Who's paying for all the for all of it the most? It's the most vulnerable people in the global south, the voiceless communities. Phasing out fossil fuels is the only way out because we're talking about the pollution of the water, of the soil, of the air. We're paying for it with asthma treatments. We're paying for it through cancer treatments. We're paying for it through loss of life, early loss of life, excuse me. And it's been going on far for decades. That's the cost of inaction and that's un unaffordable. Phasing out fossil fuels is actually the cheap port, uh, options. That's the cheap option. Why phasing out fuel, uh, fossil fuels? Because the, fu because the production ca uh, gap is very clear. The production gap, meaning the UNEP report from a couple of years ago, which told us if we're going to meet the climate change, we if we're going to meet the climate challenge, we have to phase fossil fuels on a rapid scale, not a slow scale. What have we been doing for the, la for the last uh, 10 years, roughly? 
In the last 10 years, the top 10 oil and gas companies have been adding capital expenditures, new infrastructure at the tone at the uh, tune of 600, 700, up to 900 billion dollars a year. This uh, is just the last two. This is just the last 10 years of new infrastructure. So they're doing one of two things. And when I say they, it's the companies, the prime ministers, the governments who actually sign the, the approvals for these projects. What are they doing? Option number one, they're signing our collective suicide pact. Option number two, they're duping investors with stranded, uh, with stranded assets, which means uh, it's your pension fund. It's your university. It's your university endowment. It's the philanthropist, uh, philanthropies, I guess, endowments. It's packing stranded assets and all corporate balance sheets around the globe. Some of which are in the global south. So one of two is at is a collective suicide pact, or is it financial fraud? Either way, it's criminal. It needs to be treated as such. I'm not a diplomat, so I don't mince my words. We have to be very serious about this. The science is very clear. The finance is very clear. The hidden costs are very clear. What are we doing about it? Finally, those hidden structures, the neocolonial structures, uh, I'll just spend two minutes on it and then close my remarks. We're talking about three basic structural traps. The developing world has been nudging into right after develop, into right after developing countries become independent. The first one is the loss of food sovereignty. The second one is the loss of energy sovereignty. And here I'm talking about even the biggest exporters of fossil fuels in the global south, like, like Nigeria like other countries that export crude, uh, crude oil, but uh, have to import the refined gasoline and uh, kerosene and petro petroleum uh, chemicals. The third structure and th third structural trap is the value added content of the manufacturing industry. Oops. We've been forced to specialize in as assembling line type of work where you have to import the, uh, the energy, you have to import technology, the capital, which means you export, uh, you, you, it means your export is low value added content for your import is high value added content. These three traps produce a structural trade deficit. A structural trade deficit makes your currency weaker relative to the dollar, which means Everything you need to import the next morning, food and medicine, fuel for people will be more expensive. You're importing inflation and now you're facing potential riots. So how do you stop the riots? Artificially, you borrow dollars to artificially fix your exchange rate. And now you're an external debt trap. Now I'll close with this. How do you repair this broken financial arch uh, architecture? Number one, debt can uh, cancellation. Number two, reparations for climate debt, reparations for colonial and ne uh, neocolonial debt, repa uh, reparations for bio, 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 bio piracy. There we go. Reparations for cultural heritage and uh, appropriation, reparations for colonial and neocolonial system that is still alive and well today. Part of this is starting with the debt cancellation. Phasing out the fossil fuels today, not adding six, seven billion dollars worth of new infrastructure moving forward. Thank you. Well, this next one is a shorty but goody. Uh, it is by well, it is by the job guarantee uh, author. Um, the case for a job guarantee, Pavlina R. Uh, Chernova, I'm sorry if I got that last part wrong. Anyway, uh, this one, obviously, as you can see, is monopoly money, the state as a price setter. Oops. Okay, let me get back here. 
There we go. Okay, so again, this is a short one. So let's see. Uh, yeah, the content is uh, Colonial Africa. Anyways, how does it get to it? <laughs> uh, it says the currencies exist within the context of state powers. These powers endure the state with the ability to move desired resources from the private to the public sector using economic policies targeting full employment and price stability. This paper explores, yeah, as a short one again, the paper, this paper explores the basis for understanding modern monetary system as rooted in the mon uh, monopoly powers of the state. In the first section, the case of colonial Africa will be used to demonstrate how state powers are used to divide the currency. The second section further explores uh, historic issues in the development of these powers and their institutional basis. The present day monetary system and the role played by the government are then examined, in particular, the way in which certain powers of the state turn back money, uh, bank money into the state money is explored in this section. The third part is, is intended to alleviate any doubts with regard to the government's monopoly powers in the presence of bank credit creation. In the fourth part, a ma mathematical framework is employed to demonstrate the uh, exogenous uh, prices, pricing power of the state. Finally, a conclusion is offered in which the employer of last resort uh, approach is identified as the appropriate policy framework from full employment and price stability. Now, I guess it's from page 124 from the book. Uh, colonial Africa, an il illustration of tax-driven currency. Historians of the African colon colonial experience have uh, often remarked on the manner of, in which the European co colonizers were able to establish new currencies, to give those currency values and to co compel Africans to provide goods and services in exchange for the currency. Wow, okay, this is it. Uh, I guess it'd be a footnote, but let's see. Okay, so let's see what is on this. Okay, so this is the full on. Uh, okay, so let's see, you got that. Okay, so in Malawi, there were there was an imposing of. Uh, three annual uh, hut tax over the whole colony. By the way, you can, uh, if you ever look up Warren Mosler and um, oh, I think his, uh, he always talks about Africa in, in this regard. So this might be the same story that she's telling right now. Uh, anyway, so tax over the whole colony in 1896 it was a high figure for the northern area and undoubtedly uh, stimulated further labor uh, migration to find work paying shillings in the south of uh, Mal Malawi. However, Africans prefer to meet the tax by selling products. Southern European uh, planters uh, therefore were short of labor and pressed for an even higher tax. As a result, the tax was raised in 19, 1901 to uh, shilling six, I guess, with a shilling a sh three uh, remission for those who could prove they had worked for a European uh, for at least one month. This labor tax had an immediate effect. The labor market in the South became flooded. Taxation then, if it were high enough, could force men to uh men uh force men into a uh, wage earning or uh, stitcher uh 1985 26 through 28 i'm not sure it means but whatever uh maybe it's 26 to 20 1985 there we go maybe african economists uh economies were monetized by imposing taxes and insisting on payment of taxes with european currency the experience with paying taxes were not new to Africa. What was new was the requirement that the taxes be paid in European currency. Compulsory payment of taxes in European currency was a critical measure in the monetization of African uh, economies as well as the spread of wage labor. 
in those parts of the African uh, and Africa where, where land was still in, Af in African hands, colonial governments forced Africans to produce cash crops no matter how low the prices were. The favorite technique was taxation. Money taxes were introduced as numerous uh, items, cattle, land, uh, houses, and the people themselves Money to pay taxes were, were uh, sorry, taxes was got by growing cash crops or working on European farms or in mines. Uh, yeah. Taxation as a method of forcing out laborers, but it did not distinguish between the various sources of the cash. Most Africans who could simply Sold, uh, simply sold produce or livestock to Europeans at, at, at administered prices in order to pay the tax. But where Africans were poor in items to sell or were distant from markets, taxation could produce laborers. The case of colonial African illustrates how, how taxation can serve as a launching vehicle for a new currency. Prior to colonization, African communities, uh, African communities rather, were engaged in substance, uh, substance production and internal trade and therefore had little need for European currency. After, colonial, after colonial, colonizing damn, uh, Africa, the Europeans employed a system based on taxation, excuse me, should be like speaking to the mic. Uh, based on taxation, the endowed the new currencies with value. The colonial government, in need of real goods and services such as cash crops and wage labor, imposed a tax liability on population denom uh, denominated in European currency. Taxation compelled the members of the community to sell their goods and and, and or labor to the colonial colonializers. Uh, in return for the currency that would discharge their tax obligations. Obligation. Taxation turned out to be a highly effective means of compelling Africans to enter cash crop production and to offer their labor for sale. In, in any system demo, uh, demo, democratic or authoritarian, the government can ensure the value of any, of any currency through these, um, through these basic powers, the power to levy taxes, the power to declare how tax obligations must be satisfied, and the power to issue currency, uh, yeah, currency, these, uh, blah, 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 currency, okay. These powers are the basis for securing the purchasing power of the, of the state's money. Contrary to the conventional idea that taxation finances government expenditure, here, uh, now here the, uh, da, da, da. wait a minute, here are, okay, so here the primary, primary function of taxation is guaranteeing, guaranteeing that a particular monetary unit, the one issued by the government will be, demand, uh, will be demanded in exchange for any and all other real goods and services and will thereby dominate a country's monetary system. Uh, let's see, okay. I'm gonna leave read this last portion before I uh, let you guys go for the day. Um, the government, uh, actually, hold on. Sorry, I had to grab some. Uh, anyway, so let's see. And here, how the government becomes a uh, okay, let's see, will be demanded in exchange for any and all other real uh, goods and services and will thereby dominate a country's monetary system. Let's see. And hold on, let me do some here. There we go. Uh, okay, anyway. Yeah, okay, so the government becomes a monetary monopolist. Uh, one that through exercising these powers, just like colonial governments, modern state need to obtain goods and services from the private sector in order to induce the uh, private sector to sell to the government. 
the state imposes a tax obligation on the population in, is in currency, whereas the private sector can obtain only from the government. The population pressed by the necessity to pay its legal requirements sells to the government in exchange for currency. The currency may therefore be, uh, be viewed as a tax liability to the to population that drives the transfer of the real goods and services from the private to the public debt. Of course, every time uh, secondary markets will develop so that state money becomes a general means of payment, unit of the account and medium to the to uh, of exchange. In addition, um, in addition, and as it will be discussed uh, further, uh, governments can turn only money such as bank money into state money by declaring it acceptable for payment payments uh, at a public service or a public office, excuse me, with appropriation appropriate restrictions. But these developments do not change the underlying uh, causal forces at work in determining the value of the currency. Uh, Uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to uh, talk about today and read off a little bit. I was trying to do was grab this. This is the full-on book that I think is what she was refer, uh, talking about or, or uh, I was reading off. You can get this from Amazon, unfortunately, but you can still get this from Amazon, I think. Um, and other places, I suppose, just uh, put in the, the title's name and buy or whatever, and uh, hopefully be able to find it pretty, pretty soon. But there's that again. And also, uh, once again, don't forget to go here. I know you, I know you see it when I uh, go to background, but still. I put that in my local library. I put this downstairs where I live at. So far, so good as far as a reaction. So... Again, uh, check out progressive.org, uh, subscribe to this channel, share, like, comment, and yeah, uh, support everything I do, support everything that uh, that Real Progressives do. If you want Real Progressive uh, policies to be maintained, to, to be talked about, to be promoted. And uh, anyway, thanks for watching. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys also um, learned a little bit. Uh, and uh, go to progressive.org, volunteer, donate, do whatever. Thanks, and uh, peace out for now.